Captain! Yeah, yeah? Lock! Oh crap! No, 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 no! No! Dude, we have so much crap! Dude! Holy freaking crap! Bear, get down there! Start breaking! Holy frick! Hey guys! Guys, we're cool! Chill the frick out! Chill the frick out! Troops, I saw a bear here. Today, we're going over the long-awaited naval update for Foxhole. Despite this update not having as high a number of features as, say, Foxhole Inferno, this update features some of the most complicated features in the game. New logistics method, full-on ship-to-ship combat and ship subsystems, and new amphibious capabilities, along with a bunch of other changes. Quick note, this update might be a little scatterbrain at times. Sorry for that, that's due to the very choppy release schedule of the dev branch phases. And also sorry for the excess in Warden footage. I only had so much time on my hands this week. First, let's start off with a map. And I'm gonna be honest, as someone who's been playing this game since there was only Deadlands as a map, this new map update has basically broken my brain. A bunch of towns I was used to are in completely different locations, but we're gonna run with it anyways. Alright, starting off on the east coast. Morgan's Crossing looks very different. Allsight and its neighboring towns are more or less the same, but Warmonger's Bay is truly a bay now. Heading over to Godscroft, I actually finally like it. It doesn't look as annoying to me anymore. Also, the base is still there, and now it's basically Venice. I like that. I like that a lot. Except, like, Canadian Venice, because it's all frozen and sh Further down is Slicken. St 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 it's, it's, it's shelf. It's the shelf. That's what we're gonna call it. This is really weird because the Port of Rhyme is here now, and also Henry Cavill Town is here as well. Weathered Expanse has been modified to match up with these new regions. Weathering Halls is apparently a port base now. The Clash does a new one. The devs like the baths so much they added the baths 2.0 in the form of the treasury, and Third Chapter is a cool sounding town name as well. Endless Shore has seen a few modifications. The Danan area has been completely removed, again for ship fighting. Iron Junction now has an insane asylum on it, which I think is pretty cool. Tempest Island hasn't seen that many changes, though all of the relic bases on the extremities are now islands. Down south of that, the Fingers still looks relatively the same, except they don't connect to the northern part of the map. Though this is still considered a naval or island map, since none of the roads actually connect to the mainland. And what would they connect to is a new map known as Reaver's Pass, which centers around the port town of Keel Hall and the Bay of Blackjack Junction. There's been a few other modifications on the surrounding maps to make them all match up, but nothing major. Heading back over to the west coast, down south, we've got a new island map known as Steema's Landing. And finally, I don't hate the spearhead anymore either. Up north is Fisherman's Row, and that's... Uh, pretty much unchanged, except for the extremities once again. Staterstone, Hangman's Court, and Fort Ember, and Ocean Watch are now all islands. Good. And lastly is Orebreaker Isles. Guess what, Colonials? It's back! Moving on to some of the smaller vehicles, we've got a new mechanic in-game. Towing. Yes, they finally added it, and the first vehicles you'll be towing on the field are three towable wagons. The first up is the Rooster Junk Wagon. This is for storing raw resources and common building materials. Coal, bee mats, components, sulfur, that kind of thing. Load up what you need in your wagon by throwing it in the back. Be sure to hitch it up to your truck using the context menu by hitting Shift and E and selecting Hitch Trailer, then hop in, drive away. Obviously, these can't carry as much as full supply trucks, but it's a nice addition if you want to mix and match resources and other equipment. Next up is the Rooster Tumble Box. It's a towable trailer that holds heavier items, that is to say large items, things like pipes or assembly materials, artillery shells, tripods, tripod-mounted weaponry, that sort of thing. Anything that's carried over your shoulder short of a critically wounded soldier, or else they might have to increase the game's rating. And same thing, throw your resources in the back, hitch up the trailer, and drive off. The last one is the Rooster Lamp Loader. A cheeky nod to the fact that this one is specialized for carrying fuels. Load up any fuel or water that you wish, hitch up the trailer, good to go. Oh, and 
Do be careful driving these things around. They're a little tricky to get used to, and you'd think a guy with a tiny house on wheels would be able to better drive one of these damn things in-game. All of these can be assembled at a small assembly station with the field station upgrade. Logistics is also getting another new toy in the form of heavy-duty trucks. For the Colonials, they get the AU-A150 Taurine Rigger. This is a tracked heavy truck, meaning it has better off-road capabilities than its Warden counterpart, though it might be overall slower on roads. It comes with 15 inventory slots, a driver, passenger, and several troop seats in the back, and of course, a new trailer hitch as well. The Wardens, on the other hand, get the Knut Lift Rest. Pretty much the same thing, 15 inventory slots, though it does not have tracks, so it's got better on-road performance but worse off-road performance. And also comes with a trailer hitch. One interesting feature about both of these vehicles is that they actually have a gear shift ability. If you press F while you're driving, you can shift gears, and this will enable you to have better traction and better speed when you're going up steep inclines, especially with trailers. So in general, if you load it all up, plus a trailer, you'll be able to carry more, longer distances, quicker. On the theme of towing, the Wardens are also getting a new half-track to match the number of Colonial half-tracks available. This is the Niska Mark III Scar Twin. It's a half-track with two mounted machine guns chambered in 7.92mm ammo or storm rifle ammo. It's got a driver's seat, a side seat, three passenger slots, and two MG positions. Though it'll take a little bit of coordination. You get double the firepower, but the firing arcs are something to get used to. For field guns, there's two new variants, one for the Wardens and one for the Colonials. Constructed at an assembly station with a motor pool upgrade, the Wardens are getting the Duncan's Coin 20mm field AT rifle. This is a long-range, almost sniper AT rifle. It has a magazine capacity of 4 and a crew of 2, and is towable by trucks and half-tracks with hitches. Colonials respond with the GA6 Celtis. Celtis? I don't know. Correct me in the comments. It's also constructed at an assembly station with a motor pull upgrade. It's got twin barrels with a total magazine capacity of six, and can also be towed by trucks and half tracks with hitches. Next up, we've got a new class of armor, the self-propelled guns, or SPGs. Starting off with the Colonials, they bring forth the Lance 46 Sarissa. Built on a battle tank chassis, this is an SPG that fires 150mm shells. The driver controls steering the vehicle, as well as also deploying it. All SPGs need to be deployed in order to fire. The loader will load up the shells, and also act as the vehicle's engineer, just like a battle tank. And the gunner will adjust the range and fire it. The Sarissa also has four additional slots for infantry to ride on top of, so technically it seats seven. The Wardens fire back with the Blood Arc 9 Stain. Again, this is built on a battle tank chassis. It fires 150mm shells and must deploy it before firing. In terms of its crew setup, it's nearly identical to the Sarissa. The only difference is, it does have a spot for a commander at the rear, and doesn't have seats for infantry to ride on top of. With exposed treads like those, fair enough. These vehicles also only have one item slot, and that's for the shells themselves. And both of them take heavy oil as a fuel source. It's time to set up some structures to help you offload equipment onto shore. This is where the new Navy Pier comes in. Built using metal beams, this functions pretty similarly to field bridges, although these ones are much more expensive but also much sturdier and can carry all vehicle types on them without cracking. Build these off of beaches so that you can quickly put barges and other cargo ships next to them to offload equipment on shore.
before moving on to the bigger ships, let's find out how to build them. Starting off with a new resource in the form of rare metals. These will spawn, much like copper, later into the war, and they'll be randomly spawned as you mine through salvage fields. You'll want to take these and send them off to a metalworks factory in a facility. Combining them with processed construction materials and coke, you can turn them into rare alloys. These can then be in turn used to construct a dry dock, which is where you'll build the larger ships in the game. You pick a spot that has lots of space and good defenses because these things are rather large and obviously high value targets. All right, once you have your Lodgy slave building away your dry dock, it's time for you to head over to the ammunitions factory. Using construction materials and assembly material four, you can work on some thermal shielding, which you'll need in just a little bit. Actually, put another Lodgy <clears throat> volunteer on that, because what you'll be doing is heading to the naval works to combine all of these materials together. The Naval Works is a new upgrade for the assembly station, specifically for ship parts. Here you can build naval hull segments, naval shell plating, and naval turbine components, all using an assortment of process construction materials, alloys, thermal shielding, and assembly material. So, once you place your order, stand back, let the assembly station do the work. Once it's ready, grab a crane, ship these ship parts off to the dry dock station, and here's the dry dock inventory, not too dissimilar from a seaport, though it does come with an extra button, which we'll discuss later. Submit your ship segments and select which ship type you would like to build. Commence the construction process. Give your Logi slaves some commands while you're at it. Once the ship is done, then you can use the new button to either open or close the dry dock area. But to let a ship free, you'll want to open it. And voila! Ship is now set to sail. Easy, right? Oh, and do keep in mind that the dry dock is where you'll come to repair larger ships as well. Let's start from the smallest watercraft to the largest watercraft. First up is not actually two new vehicles, but complete reworks of two older vehicles, so they might as well be new. For the Colonials, they've got the Type C Caron gunboat. It's now fitted with a driver's seat, a walkable deck, a main gun at the front that fires mortars, believe it or not, with the option to use it in direct and indirect fire modes, and two tripod weapon mounts, port and starboard. Its storage capacity is fairly limited and can really only take on ammunition. This really is just a small patrol and river craft. It's not meant for anything super heavy, but in the shallower waters, it'll be the best firepower you can get on the wakes. The Wardens, on the other hand, get the 74B-1 Ronin gunboat. It's got a similar suite of features, got a driver's seat. This one actually comes with its own below deck area, where you can access the mortar turret, once again, firing mortars in direct or indirect fire mode. And it's got two tripod weapon slots, though these ones are fore and aft rather than port and starboard. And once again, has storage capacity for mainly its ammunition. This is also a really good time to bring up that water physics in Foxhole have been reworked for all ships. They feel a little bit more, well, pun intended, floaty. And while that might make precise steering a little more difficult, it does allow you to do certain things like shift them in place against objects or do more drift-like maneuvers. Though do be careful, the bouncing up and down if you're going really fast might interfere with your gunner's accuracy. All right, before we dive into the big ships themselves, a few notes. Some or all of the mechanics I'm about to mention will apply to all of these new big ships. So if I don't mention them, but you see the item that I'm about to list on the ship itself, it probably has that mechanic. Starting with the anchor. All large vessels have an anchor used to deploy the vessel, located at either the fore or the aft of the ship, indicated by this symbol. Associated with deploying a ship are naval turrets. Mechanically, naval turrets in Foxhole are garrisoned AI turrets, which will target nearby enemy vessels only when the ship is deployed. They are usually smaller guns on a ship marked with a flag, just like you would see in, say, a pillbox. You cannot deploy ships and activate their naval turrets within 150 meters of a region border, and you cannot deploy a ship if an enemy ship is already nearby. Spotter seats in ships are usually side by side with a driver, and you don't need to bring a pair of binoculars to act as a ship spotter. You will get that vision range 
when you hop into the seat. Something I mentioned briefly in the last section about gunboats was the ability for certain guns to have indirect and direct fire capabilities. Direct is pretty simple. Just like shooting a rifle in-game, you point, you shoot, target goes boom, assuming your accuracy is any good. Indirect fire mode is more like artillery, where you're aiming with the azimuth and the distance, and firing arcing shots at a much longer distance. So again, direct fire is for short range, indirect for long range. Heading below deck, we have the following functions. Magazines. For ships, like battleships, with larger guns, you'll have ready ammo racks, just like the ones that you can build inside of bunkers, that you can put shells into and pull shells from in the heat of battle. Engine rooms. These rooms usually contain a pair of engines, one for the port propeller and one for the starboard propeller. Using a wrench, you can change the direction of propellers in order to gain turning speed or speed up your reverse speed. It'll take careful coordination between a driver and an engineer, but master it, and you'll be able to turn on a dime. Crew quarters. Not all large ships have these, but many of them do. Indicated by bunk beds. Treat these as if they were a bunker. You can set your spawn, stockpile items on the ship, reserve the ship to your squad, that sort of thing. Pretty much everything you can do inside a bunker. Flooding. When a ship takes a hit and a shell penetrates the hull of the ship, if the breach is above the waterline, no water will flood into the ship. However, if the breach is below the waterline, water will start to flood into the ship and must be bailed out with buckets, and the breach will continue to leak until it is fixed with basic materials. Also note that breaches above the waterline will start to flood if the ship takes on enough water, as the ship will sink deeper into the ocean as it takes on water. Another way to mitigate this is to seal the bulkhead doors. These doors are the ones on the lower level of the ship indicated with these portholes and wheel locks. Sealing a portion of the ship off prevents the flood from spreading to different compartments. The downside is that if a compartment gets completely flooded, you will be unable to access that section of the ship and will need to return to a dry dock in order to repair the damage. As a side note, larger ships have an enormous amount of health, so damaging a ship to the point where it just explodes is not impossible, but extremely difficult. You're much better off targeting multiple sections of the ship and trying to flood it as quickly as possible to burden the enemy crew and to sink the ship under the waves. Ship captains will also be able to see the heading and speed of their vessel underneath the compass area. Shipyards also have the ability to repair the armor of small boats similar to garages. Ship interiors are sheltered from snowstorms. Large ships with crew cabins, or a barracks, will allow players to deploy from them from home region. So you want to do a proper naval landing? You're going to need one of these ships. This is the BMS Longhook, available to both factions. It's got a ramp at the aft. The anchor is also located here. Use this to deploy and undeploy the ship. You'll notice that the series of cranes moves when you deploy the ship. It's also equipped with two 12.7mm machine guns at the front end of the ship, right next to the captain's cabin. Down below deck, you've got your engine room, where you can change the direction of your propellers, and at the aft, you've got the crew cabin and a stockpile to go along with it. Use this area to set your spawn. Going back above deck, in the captain's cabin, is where you can control the ship itself. But more importantly, when you redeploy the ship, there's an area you can activate in order to build landing ships. These are what will ferry your troops from the ship offshore to the beaches. For landing ships, the wardens get the McNamara Shore Runner. It's got a driver's seat, a passenger slot, and a troop and vehicle loading area. Now this loading area can be used just for troops if you want, but you can also bring vehicles onto it. Field guns, light utility vehicles, tankettes or scout tanks, you can even bring light tanks onto this. So if you need firepower when you hit the beach, use one of these. Likewise though, the Colonials also have one in the form of the Interceptor PA-12 landing ship. Pretty much same functionality. Same capacity, same crew size, same troop and cargo area. Lastly. When you land with one of these landing ships, if you activate them, you can actually disassemble them and recover half of the bee mats you use to build them. This is to ensure that beaches don't get clogged and that you get some bee mats back for your efforts. We're going to deviate just a little bit, but I promise this leads into the next ship type. The following vehicle types can now be shipped in flatbeds and another ship type, which I will talk about. 
Warden Scout Tanks, Colonial Tankettes, and Warden and Colonial Light Tanks. All variants can be shipped via flatbeds and... Speaking of tanks being able to be loaded onto ships, here is a ship you can load tanks onto. This is the BMS Bluefin. I think the easiest way to describe this ship is to describe it as a amphibious stockpile. Let's go over the features, and then you'll see what I mean. First up, it's got a driver's seat and a spotter seat. The anchor for the ship is located at the aft. Below decks, you've got the engine room and just general personnel quarters, though there is no spawn point on this ship, to take note. And then towards midship, you've got the loading bay. So there's two separate stockpiles on the ship. One for ammunition can be accessed by activating these crates. The other stockpile is for crates and vehicles. That can be activated in the center of this loading bay. You've also got the ramp controls in the loading bay. Use this lever to activate it. Climbing up these ladders to the fore, and then the second set of ladders, you can also see the crane tower. And it does exactly what you think it does. You can use it to load crates and vehicles onto the loading bay. And it also comes equipped at the fore end with two 12.7mm machine guns. The last bit of armament is it does come with one of the naval turrets. As long as you deploy the ship, these turrets will activate and auto-target enemies that approach it. I would describe this as a second wave ship in an amphibious assault. Once you secure a beachhead, using a bluefin is great for deploying massed amounts of supplies and armor to shore. One other interesting feature that it has is that it can actually deploy at sea, so you don't actually need to land it on a beach. And if you've got amphibious vehicles like APCs or that Warden-specific LUV, you can deploy them directly into the ocean off of this ship. Do remember though, all the ramps have to be closed up, the crane has to be undeployed, and the anchor has to be weighed in order for the ship to get moving. And to fuel it, it takes heavy oil. Alright, first up for the bigger combat vessels is the Colonial Conqueror class destroyer. Its armaments include two dual barrel 120mm turrets, one dual barrel 40mm turret, two depth charge launchers, two 12.7mm machine guns, and its recommended crew size is 12 crew members or above. There's also three additional slots on deck. First off is the driver's seat, obviously who drives the ship. Second is a spotter who, without binoculars, can spot far out into the distance. And thirdly is a unique destroyer ability, which is the sonar operator. The sonar operator has access to two modes, long range directional and short range. Long range will detect any vessels in the direction that you point, though it won't tell you if they're hostile and it won't tell you if they are moving or not. It'll give you back a signal strength with one being the weakest, meaning that the ship is just at the limits of your detectable range, and a hundred being right on top of you, or I guess in this case, right below you. The short range is a lot more precise. It'll give you distance to the target, its bearing, and its depth, and as well, it will give you a visual for that item, so in this case, a submarine diving down low. The other role I should mention is the depth charge launcher. If you're hunting submarines, as shown in the last example, there are two depth charge launchers amidship. You'll need to load up the new Model 7 EV depth charges. These are then fired in an arc pattern from the launchers. While you're on this seat, you can adjust the depth at which the depth charges will detonate and the distance from the ship that they are fired. Below the waves lies the Warden Submarine, the Naki. It's armed with two torpedo tubes, a dual barrel 40mm gun on its top deck, and hopefully a good crew to put it under the waves in an emergency. I'll mention this even though I've already described how anchors work. The anchor for the submarine is at the front, although it's not always visible since usually it's below the waterline. Heading down the hatch, do be careful, you will take damage if you just straight fall. This console here with the wheel is the driver's seat, helps to control the direction of the submarine. 
The seat behind the driver is a sonar operator, same as the destroyer. You can use it to mark targets at long range and at short range. On the opposite side of the room from the sonar station is the torpedo station. Now torpedoes have fuses, so you can actually set what distance you want the torpedo to detonate at, though they will also explode on contact. You can also adjust the upwards or downwards trajectory of a torpedo by rolling the mouse wheel. The torpedo tubes can hold a total of 8 torpedoes, plus whatever you decide to put in the submarine's inventory. Across the aisle from the driver's seat is the dive officer's seat. This control console allows you to turn a pair of fins on the front of the submarine. As you're traveling forward, if these fins are pointed downwards, it'll make the submarine dive, assuming the ballast is set properly. More on that in a second. If they're pointed up, it'll make the submarine rise. But this only works if you're traveling forwards. Much like a plane's flaps, you can't actually get any lift without moving forward. But not the only way you can dive with a submarine. The other way you can dive is with ballast. There are three ballast spots on the ship. You've got your main ballast tank in the center of the submarine. At the front end, you've got the negative ballast tank. And at the rear, in the engine room, you've got the safety ballast tank. You might have to play around with this just to get used to how these control. Basically, the safety ballast should usually be kept full of air, or at 0%. Setting the main ballast to 100% or fully blown will help you to maintain neutral buoyancy. And the negative ballast at the front, if full of air, will help the submarine rise as it's traveling forward, or if fully blown, will help it submerge even deeper if it's traveling forward. Now, this is an oversimplification, and obviously there's a lot of room to play around with all of these ballasts. Some other scenarios are that if all the ballasts are completely blown and at 100% filled up with water, the submarine will sink continuously. And if you combine that with the dive officer diving the submarine down as hard as possible, you'll do what's pretty much called a crash dive, which is an emergency dive in a really bad situation. Though it's very important, remember, if you dive 20 meters or lower in the water, you will start to take crush damage, where you'll start to spring leaks on your submarine. And because you're underwater, you can't exactly bail that water out. But if you need to rise the submarine out of an emergency crushing situation, just fill all the ballasts with air and you'll rise to the surface. Oh, and the last seat I should talk about is the periscope. Even though you won't be able to see much around you when you're underwater, using the periscope can help you identify targets, since you'll be able to see them from, well, not underwater. And the periscope range is actually quite far, all the way up to 350 meters. The very last submarine mechanic I'll mention is the battery charge. Submarines can charge their batteries pretty quick, but they can only do it if they're on the surface. Diving below the waves, the batteries will not charge, and then from that point on, every few seconds you stay underwater, the battery will drain. Every action you take, such as flooding the ballasts or firing torpedoes or activating the sonar, will also consume battery, so your time under the waves is quite limited, so use it well. Another naval weapon you should be aware of are the E680-S Rudderlock. They are a type of sea mine. They're specifically for hunting submarines. When you're on a ship, grab one of these mines, right click to aim them off the side of the ship, use the mouse wheel to adjust at what depth they'll sit at, and then left click to lay them. They'll only last two or so days, so don't think of them as permanent structures. In terms of battleships, the Colonials are up first with their Titan-class battleship. Pretty straightforward, this is a battleship, so it's meant for blasting things away at close and at long range. Its armaments include two triple-barrel 150mm main battery guns, one two-barrel 120mm secondary battery gun, two double-barrel 40mm sponson turrets, port and starboard, and two 12.7mm machine guns, also port and starboard, as well as one garrison two-barrel naval turret. And the recommended crew size for a ship like this is 12 crew members or more. Also note that the captain's cabin and the spotter's lookout are located side by side at the forward end doors on the main deck. Sailing in the other direction is the Warden, Callahan-class battleship. It comes equipped 
with three double barrel 150 millimeter turrets, two dual 120 millimeter turrets, port and starboard, two 12.7 millimeter heavy machine guns, once again port and starboard. It's got four 30 millimeter deck guns, two amidship port and starboard, and two aft port and starboard. And it comes equipped with two naval guns, one fore and one aft. And its recommended crew size is 16. It functions more or less similarly to the Colonial one. You've got your engine room, crew quarters, ammunition racks. The spotter and driver's seat are at the top of the forward stairs, similar to the Colonial one. The anchor is at the front. And one special thing is that the bar is on the lower decks at the aft section. The next big change is that nukes are coming back to the game. They're a little bit different than you might remember them. Instead of being world structures that either side can claim, they are now a buildable structure with the ballistic missile itself being built in pieces at a small assembly station with a rocket manufactory upgrade. It's built in three parts. One of the large materials you'll need in order to build them is crafted at the ammunition factory. Unstable substances using heavy explosive materials and flame ammo. Once you have all of these three parts, you can then ship them off to your A0E-9 rocket platform, which as you'll know is the old rocket platform, but now you can build it anywhere as long as you have it on a concrete pad and you have 100 rare metals, which are also a new resource to work with. Now from this facility, you can launch the rocket. Similar how you did before, it'll take a few days using heavy oil to fuel the rocket. And then a code must be entered. However, this code is no longer derived from a individual soldier with a radio backpack. It is now instead derived from an intelligence center. When someone uses an intelligence center, it'll give them a set of coordinates associated with where they're pointing the intelligence center radar. Additionally, they can only be fired within the same region or into an adjacent region, so you can't jump more than two hexes with them. Although there is a higher barrier to using nukes now, it will be interesting to see what a war without a limit on the number of nukes actually looks like, even if they are really expensive. When it comes to stopping a rocket launch, they can be cancelled by either three members of the flaming squad, and afterwards a new launch can't be started for another four hours. The rocket, the rocket's site, or its active listening post can be destroyed. And when a rocket is destroyed, they no longer drop any materials. It's just a complete destruction. And visibly damaging the rocket will delay its rocket launch until it's repaired. You'll also notice that rocket sites have new icons as well as rocket impact sites, and whether the rocket launch site is loaded with a rocket or not. Some other rocket changes include rocket launch sites are now reusable. Launch sites can be claimed for 76 hours, just like any bunker or facility piece. Launch codes are no longer reused and are now instead randomized each time. Warning sirens will only play at world bases where the rocket will have an impact. Anyone standing underneath a rocket as it launches will be set on fire, fun times. And the Intel Center UI has been updated to accommodate the launching process. And lastly, and definitely not because I forgot until the last minute, we've got oil rigs or offshore platforms. Bringing a barge to one of these platforms, you can build them up and obtain resources from them. In the production panel, heavy oil is actually free. You just have to go and collect it every so often. But enriched oil will cost you coal. Both of these oils are crucial to naval operations, so controlling these oil rigs will help you to project your naval power abroad. It's a very quick breakdown, but if you want a much more detailed breakdown of basically any of the elements I've talked about throughout this update, go and see Freerik's channel. He does a lot of Foxhole tutorials and has been for years, and goes through every single step of the process in much greater detail. Note that some older vehicles have also had hitches added to them to allow them to tow, such as the Dune Transport, Leatherback, Land Runner, the R1 Hauler, R5 Sisyphus, and R9 Spear Tip, as well as the HHB Hoplite. Bodies of water freezing due to maximum intensity snowstorms have been disabled temporarily. Vehicles produced at facilities are automatically squad locked to the squad that has the structure reserved. 
Exiting the driver's seat of a vehicle that's in motion causes the vehicle to quickly, but not instantaneously, come to a stop. When traveling between regions, your travel is cancelled if a vehicle's weapons are fired or if the vehicle is moved. Water buckets can now only be submitted to stockpiles when they're empty, wouldn't want to get the ammo wet. Observation bunkers now have a spotter seat that can be entered. Sniper rifles and automatic weapons, excluding the Malone Mark II machine gun and the Gast machine gun, now be fired from gunboats and the BMS pack mule flatbeds. Ooh, battle flatbeds. Welcome back. The rocket factory modification for the small assembly station has been renamed to the battery line. And the rocket factory modification for the ammunition factory has been renamed Rocket Battery Workshop. Also note that there's a bunch of new icons for the small assembly station to make it a lot easier to distinguish which one you're trying to build. They also have a lot of new trinkets on the assembly station platform, so it's much easier to tell at a glance what that platform is supposed to produce. And there's been improved collision responses when a vehicle is in contact with multiple surfaces simultaneously. Some balance changes include the BMS Iron Ship health has decreased from 4,000 down to 2,600 and has been given armor. The BMS Aqua Tipper has also been given armor and its health has been reduced from 1440 down to 950. Both gunships, the Charon and the Ronin, now have armor as well. The Ballista has had its armor health increased by 53%. Minimum penetration chance has been improved. Its speed has been increased and its mobility has also been increased. The Scorpion has also seen similar upgrades, with armor health increasing by 30%, minimum penetration chance has also been improved, speed and mobilities for this have also been increased. But its cost has changed from 5 construction materials to 5 process construction materials, 10 assembly material 1, 3 assembly material 4. The R5 Sisyphus Hauler max speed has been increased. The Riker 4-3F Wasp Nest has had its range increased from 300 to 325 meters. Its accuracy firing at max range has been increased by 14%. And the 120-68 Coronides Field Gun added 15 degrees of traverse to the left and right side of the barrel. There were a boatload of other changes and bug fixes along with this update. But at some point, I have to stop this recording because the devs keep changing this and we are 24 hours away from the update as of me recording this. If there's anything I missed, I will try to post it in a pinned comment down below. If not, as always, you can check out the patch notes, see all of the bug fixes and all of the other changes I might have missed. That does it for this update. Thanks for tuning in. Definitely one of the longest ones I've ever had to work on, if not the longest. But it's here. They took my suggestions and they ran with them. And man, am I excited about it. What's your favorite part of this update? The shore component, the amphibious component, or the sea and oceans component? Let me know in a comment down below. Thank you all for checking out this update. As always, be sure to like, subscribe, and share this with all the sailors and seamen out there. They all want to get their sea likes ready for this one. Special thanks to Robert Loved Games, who also does a lot of Foxel content here on YouTube. I'll link his channel down below. And as always, good luck, move up those beaches, and stay in your foxholes. Bear out. I need a bandage. Anyone got one? <laughs>